Kelly Mullen has been a champion uh, involved uh, at the Newport Restoration Foundation uh, for at least one, five years now on crafting Keeping History Above Water, which is not just a conference, it is an initiative for uh, the Newport Restoration Foundation. So she's going to talk today about one element of that, and that is a partnership with the Rhode Island School of Design. And so that will be her presentation. Uh, Dr. Leslie Keyes is the um, Director of Historic Preservation for Flagler College. She is also an assistant professor uh, in history at Flagler College, has been a very long time preservationist, longer than me, um, and she'll give a little bit of her background as well. But St. Augustine, Florida uh, is ground zero. Uh, I think they've, every hurricane that's happened in the last however many here, years seems to hit St. Augustine. So she has her own personal stories to tell about uh, hurricanes, evacuations, and how historic preservation uh, and the protection of uh, cultural resources fits into that. So I'll start off by asking Kelsey to come up here. Good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction, Leslie. It is really gratifying to see in the audience uh, mostly people I don't know uh, at this point and uh, new folks coming to the issue, but also a handful of folks who've been involved with keeping history above water since the beginning and have brought it to their respective communities or continued that conversation a little bit closer to home. Um, as Leslie mentioned, for the last number of years, I've been um, knee deep, pun intended, um, in this issue. And uh, I'm very happy to share this piece of Keeping History Above Water with you all. Um, as of Monday, I have moved up Narragansett Bay and I'm now in Providence, uh, but I'm not so far removed from the issue that I'm not still thinking about Keeping History Above Water all the time um, and just sitting very nicely behind some hurricane barriers, but no less uh, protected by, from this issue. Um, so today, this piece of Keeping History Above Water is uh, Lisa mentioned, is part of a broader initiative of work. Um, so far today, we've heard from planners, we've heard from engineers, we've heard from climate scientists, and I am bringing sort of the education um, and public engagement piece to the conversation. Um, some of the greatest value around keeping history above water is its inter interdisciplinary nature, and hopefully that holds some value for you all. So I'm gonna give you just a moment to take this graphic in. It's, it's quite tiny from where you're sitting, but um, there, for scale, here are some uh, helicopters, right? So that's quite a large structure that you're looking at. Um, now I assume most of you are familiar with Nantucket, at least um, between here and the ferry terminal. So imagine for a moment that the downtown of Nantucket was turned vertical and became a vertical city block. Um, this is a pretty radical notion. There are many reasons why it wouldn't work from an engineering perspective, and I'm not even an engineer and I can tell you that. Um, but it's a provocative idea, and it's one worth engaging with. Um, and this is what I'll be talking about um, at our work with RISD and the provocative ideas that came out of that collaboration. So in Newport, um, we are very familiar with this issue of sea level rise and um, particularly interested in one neighborhood called the Point neighborhood, which is a low-lying area, um, a gridded network of streets, one of the oldest neighborhoods in the country, and it retains more 18th century homes than most places along the East Coast. Um, what you're seeing with these graphics are the same graphics that you'll see over and over again once you start grappling with this issue of sea level rise. These are the projections, the one foot sea level rise, the three foot sea level rise, the five foot sea level rise, all of which are well comfortably within the projections over the next hundred years on the East Coast. Um, and this is the point neighborhood at each of those levels, one, three, and five. The Newport Restoration Foundation is engaged with this issue through its own particular lens, which is as uh, an owner and steward of about 25 properties in this neighborhood in particular, um, many of which are imminently threatened by uh, rising sea level and uh, storm inundation and so on. 
Uh, this is just one such property of ours, but there are many more. And we have several along one street in particular called Bridge Street. This is 74 Bridge Street. Um, this was a few months before our first conference. Um, and it illustrates the issue perfectly. Uh, you have a 1725 structure um, of historical significance sitting at the lowest lying area of the Point neighborhood and inundated with icy water in uh, late January. Uh, this is the building that for us inspired the conference and it continues to inspire um, vexing concerns about what to do with it. Um, most of our properties are rented to individual homeowners as tenants. This property remains unoccupied because it's our case study for resilience. What do you do with historic resources when they are directly impacted uh, by climate and in this case, sea level rise? So. At this moment, um, we were looking at this building which floods on a regular basis. You walk into the basement, it smells like the ocean, uh, which is not a good sign, <laughs> um, and wondering what to do with it. We engaged with a few um, architectural firms to develop ideas around the 2016 conference. Um, and I know there's one representative in the audience who would be happy to take more particular questions. Um, but in thinking about this issue, because we own a number of properties on this street and many more in this neighborhood, it's not really about an individual property. It's about a network of buildings, a fabric of history that is irreplaceable once damaged or lost. So we engaged with the Rhode Island School of Design. We are very fortunate to have some top-notch design talent up the road in Providence. Um, and they have this wonderful program called uh, the Interior Architecture Program, um, which translated means the department that is concerned with um, adaptive reuse and interventions to existing buildings. Um, and they, in, as part of their coursework, have an advanced design studio that looks at buildings and communities that either need to be adapted in a significant way, either because of a change of purpose or because of a change of environmental circumstance. Um, and they were casting about for a project in 2016. And we uh, collaborated with them to look at 74 Bridge Street, that big red building underwater, um, and bring their students in to look at it. Now, they, the, in this advanced design studio, it was about 12 students, um, graduate students who were all brand new to the issue of climate impact on cultural heritage. They brought with them an international perspective. There was only one student from the United States, so they had a variety of experiences and worldviews that affected the eventual outcome. They worked all semester to evaluate this one building and develop different interventions to it. Um, and it ended up uh, producing four different scenarios and a community open house at the end of the semester. And I'll walk you through that process. The class broke up into five groups um, and they used this matrix around four different concepts to begin organizing their work. Um, they looked at scenarios related to protecting resources, retreating um, from various circumstances, accommodating water and change, and empowering communities. Um, this matrix that you see on the wall was their first uh, attempt at getting their brains around this issue, again, as design students who really were having to learn the science very quickly, were learn having to learn the history of this neighborhood very quickly. Um, but this was sort of the framework that informed the subsequent projects. Uh, they also were looking at different time scales. So each of the student groups organized around one of these concepts, but they also had to look at their concept at the 25 year mark, 50 year mark, 100 year mark. These are all very arbitrary as we know and the issue extends far beyond the 100 year mark. Um, but it gave us a sense of how might we begin to phase change over time to respond to some of these issues. So we'll come back to this concept. This is called uh, the concept of obstruct. Um, and this is, I would say, the most provocative of the designs. It invites immediate reaction. Nobody thinks that this is a great idea, but it starts to get you thinking about what your community or what your um, 
neighbor neighborhood will tolerate in terms of change. Uh, we've heard already that communities affected by climate impact are unlikely to look as they are in another 50 years, um, but do we want them to look like this? Um, there are additional renderings and graphics that show how people would move laterally in between this um, vertical city block. Uh, you have the water level down here with a, an appropriately stormy sea. Um, again, wind speed is a real issue here. How do people engage uh, vertically? What, what sorts of lifts? It, the technicalities don't really matter. This is meant to prompt in you an immediate reaction, and it did just that for the folks we shared it with. This is perhaps a more palatable idea. Another group came up with this concept of uh, gray, green, blue, which is the integration of uh, built infrastructure, green infrastructure, and allowing the water in, in sort of a Venice concept that some streets would become canals allowing water into, again, this, this highly gridded neighborhood. So you could, in theory, turn alternate streets into canals. Um, and with the use of some um, strategic planting and green infrastructure, create communities that could more or less retain their original character, the relationship of buildings to other buildings, to the street, to your neighbors, um, in a way that feels familiar but allows for future change. This is another rendering of that particular concept. This is a very similar concept, um, living with water. Again, a canal sort of uh, scheme where you have bridges and sidewalks. You, folks can walk around. There's a little amphitheater here that could fill up with water in the event of a storm. Um, houses are elevated or on floating pylons. Um, you see the the skyline here, this is actually quintessentially Newport skyline here, that gives you the sense that this community, this neighborhood, is still very much intact with much more water than before. And then we have this concept, um, which was not an intervention related to a building, but instead it was a game, it was a board game, a shoots and ladders of consensus building. Um, we have, around this issue of sea level rise, looked to the smallest agents of change, the individual property owners, to problem solve for an existential threat. That's our strategy right now. If you have the means, if you have the interest to raise your property, please do that. Otherwise, we're still sort of grappling with how abstract the, the nature of climate impact on our lives really is. The game was designed to start conversations around decision making in your, in your neighborhood instead of just thinking about your acreage or your plot of land. How do you begin conversations with your neighbor across the street or down the road to make collective decisions around what to do in your neighborhood in the event of true and lasting change to the way the neighborhood looks and feels? Um, there was a digital piece to this as well. Um, and we'll see at the end, there was an opportunity to try this out. And then finally, the last concept is memory traces. Um, this too is more of a provocative concept. The notion being that over time, a concrete like substance would be applied to the exterior of your home as the waters rose, and you'd add layer after layer after layer over time until such time as you could not live in your home anymore. And then it would become a sort of cast of the original house and a park um, that you could experience as um, a resident, uh, but you could not actually live in these structures anymore. So here you get a sense of the fabric of the neighborhood that once was, but is no longer. In the event of a storm, these parks absorb the water and protect the rest of the city. This is one way that the students were trying to um, tease apart what it means to lose this history, not just these structures um, and this, the relationships you have with your neighbors. What does it mean when you lose an entire neighborhood that is nationally significant? How do you remember that place? Um, how do we remember places that don't exist anymore? 
So those were the five concepts that st the students came up with. Um, that took about the first half of the semester. There were a number of critiques. We gave them feedback. They revised further. Um, the second half of the semester was what the Newport Restoration Foundation was most interested in, which was using these ideas as a communications tool. So RISD being RISD, they have lots of fun toys um, and different sorts of funding um, that nonprofits don't ordinarily get to play with. And so they brought the concept of augmented and virtual realities to the conversation. What would it be like if we made these scenarios more real for people? What does sea level rise feel like? What does it sound like? What does it, um, how does it change as you move through a space? And so here we have the memory traces concept um, in a screen capture of the virtual reality. And uh, we were able to share this virtual reality with a number of folks at the end of the semester at an open house. So the students worked for four months, um, always with the notion that they would share these ideas with the public and not just any public, um, specifically the public that lived in this neighborhood, um, the residents of these homes, um, and the folks who are most threatened by sea level, sea level rise in Newport right now. They were invited to come to 74 Bridge Street, this time not underwater, um, and engage with these ideas. The students put together an exhibition of each of their concepts uh, and were ready to share the details with um, folks as they strolled by. And then we got to play. So here uh, on the left, this is the virtual reality. They brought in two headsets um, and had them hooked up to very complicated machines that I don't totally understand. Um, but when you put on a headset, you could walk through an environment. You could walk through the Point neighborhood as it might look in 75 years and start to get a sense of the texture of what that change could be like. Um, the gentleman here is, was at the time the Newport Restoration Foundation's facilities manager. So he was, um, you can see looking actually surprisingly quite pleased um, for a man who was thinking about how these changes would affect heating and cooling and electrical systems in our uh, 80 plus properties. And then on the right here, we have the augmented reality. And in this case, we used Google Cardboard. Um, visitors were led through a process by which they could download an app and hold their phone up to various landscapes around 74 Bridge Street and see on their phones um, what rising sea level would look like in that particular location. Um, it took a little bit of uh, teaching and engagement with folks to get them hooked up to the Google Cardboard. Um, some took to it faster than others. Um, this was maybe our youngest participant and he put on that headset and was like, good to go. Um, was moving through an environment very comfortably. Um, we talked to him afterwards and he thought it was really cool. Um, but it's in his lifetime, in another 75 years or so, that he will see some of these major systemic changes to his community. This is the game in action. So here we had community members who, some, some of whom were neighbors and knew each other, many of whom didn't know one another, coming around um, the board game to make decisions about their, uh, their property and um, ask questions of one another and compromise and um, disagree respectfully. All of these skills that are important in a functioning democracy, um, but also really important when uh, our individual success is tied to collective success. And I would say that that is, that for us at the Newport Restoration Foundation, was the most successful piece of this collaboration with RISD. Um, it was extremely interesting, of course, to see these students develop five um, really boundary pushing ideas to see those renderings printed out. Um, but we were most interested in how do you start to engage people about what these changes actually mean in a community? Um, how do we communicate the um, 
level of threat without uh, that leading to inaction and immobility? How do you get folks at varying levels of understanding and expertise um, to participate fully and leave conversations feeling empowered and engaged rather than um, paralyzed and <laughs> fearful? Um, and in this open house, which had about 150 attendees, we saw all of that happening um, before us. We had a few city council members attend, um, very interested in what it would mean to continue that conversation with the Newport Restoration Foundation and many other organizations in Newport. And it took what we had produced, this is um, the case study report we produced for the conference around 74 Bridge Street, and it brought it into an experiential dimension, which is really hard. Human beings, our brains are not wired to actually understand a timescale beyond about 15 years. Um, maybe you can push people to 30 because that's the life cycle of a mortgage, but beyond that, it, it's very difficult for us developmentally to understand time and consequence. And so here we were able to use tools um, through our work with RISD to begin communicating some of those concepts and make it a little bit easier to imagine a future that looks very different um, and engage people around solutions. That's it. Well, since Lisa set me up, um, on the age thing, okay. <laughs> I have been practicing historic preservation for 40 years. Clearly, I am a child prodigy. Okay. <laughs> Just remember all that, all right? Um, finished two master's degrees, history program at Virginia Tech and urban and regional planning, and then went off to do great and wonderful work until some crazy people at the University of Florida, and Mar Marty doesn't get included in that yet, but his predecessor convinced me to go back and get a PhD and to come to Penn as part of that. So I, sure, I encourage you that if you do not have enough to do when you have your first grandchild, go back to school again. It will keep you busy. And my grandson could not understand why his grandmother needed to be in school at the same time he was learning how to spell words, decided that perhaps Grammy wasn't very smart after all. Now, I have spent 30 years of my professional career in Florida. I've spent, I spent seven in Louisville, Kentucky. So I'm also a Kentucky Colonel and make you a great mint julep, which is why we started the Keeping History Above Water Conference a little bit ahead of time. We did the first Saturday in May on Derby Day. The conference officially started the next day Cinco de Mayo, so we keep everybody happy there. And we did a three and a half day conference, a little more complicated than this one. Marty and I co-chaired that. Uh, it took us 18 months to pull it together. We had visitors from lots of states and a few countries, and we had more than 60 speakers. So uh, this is great to be here, and it's a little calmer version <laughs> than we had there. Uh, the other thing I will tell you that I learned is uh, when I was up here doing research in 2011 as a Penn student, Marty had me over in the Historical Association Research Library, and I'm a big walker. I walk every single morning, and so I checked on all the dead people in the cemeteries and saw a few names that I recognized. And it turns out my Quaker ancestors are part of the gardeners. So anyway... Uh, the other thing to tell you, I grew up in Indiana. You may have seen recent storm damage in Ohio and Indiana hit three small towns. The Indiana small town is a little place called Pendleton, which is where my Quaker ancestors went from here and through Pennsylvania and Ohio. And so Pendleton got clobbered pretty thoroughly. So the houses are all still standing, but most everybody's trees are down. The park is gone. The trees in the park are completely gone. So. If we don't have enough damage from hurricanes, then we get to do tornadoes. Now, having also said that, I did talk to the filmmaker a couple seconds after he finished because what brought me to Florida the second time in 1993 was Andrew, which had hit in 1992. And the state of Florida worked with FEMA at the time to designate properties that should have been recognized as historic and had not gone through that official process. So I worked in the Florida Keys for four years after Hurricane Andrew, protecting properties in Key West, up in Marathon, 
Uh, the Key Largo Anglers Club had an Adirondack building had been damaged. So I certainly remember Hurricane Andrew. I can also tell you efficiently how to evacuate in 72 hours and how to prepare. I've done um, museum work. So I put together a manual for the museums down there and the historic sites. We worked with Whitehall. I know a number of you have ties to Palm Beach. So we worked with them to figure out how many staff you need over that course of the 72 hours to pack and crate and inventory items and get ready for that. So right, that's my two cents worth on the hurricane. This is not what we're gonna talk about, but when you think of climate change and sea level rise in Florida, you probably think, so, think of Miami. Picture on the left is pretty current. They are still building condos on the beach in Miami, even though since 2016, traditional lending sources are not generally available. A $100 million condo that is going to be amortized over 50 years doesn't get traditional funding anymore. So you can have private funding, all sorts of other options, but banks are not doing that. And that 30-year mortgage cycle is probably not going to last in Florida very long. They're encouraging us to think in 15 and 20-year timeframes. Pictures at the bottom. Miami has spent more than $100 million raising streets and sidewalks. That just gave Hurricane Irma another little challenge, and she succeeded. This is one of the cranes on the right-hand side. There were 12 cranes in downtown Miami when that hurricane went through. They are supposed to be built to withstand 200 mile an hour winds. Clearly not. So. This is what we're going to talk about. The little tiny city, several hundred miles north, St. Augustine, and about 25 miles south of Jacksonville. It just happens to have the oldest masonry fortification in the United States. And since we are in Massachusetts, it predates Plymouth by 55 years. The nation's oldest city was founded in 1565. We did a partnership with Lisa and the Craig Group, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which helps providing small grants to do special projects that will be startups to launch to bigger projects. The city of St. Augustine and Flagler College. Again, I know a number of you probably haven't been to St. Augustine, but I'm pretty sure some of you have seen parts of Henry Flagler stuff because you spend other time in Florida. So you are going to see the first city that Flagler, who was a co-founder with John D. Rockefeller in Standard Oil. This is the first place he spent some money. What we did is a workshop that you are all doing here as well on community values. What do you consider to be the important pieces of your community as far as resources? What are we gonna keep? What are we gonna adapt? Are we gonna let go? Why do we need to think about this? Because FEMA, we all probably need at some point, is going to help you once you have made that determination. That becomes the basis to apply for additional funding sources and to do more planning in your communities. So this is what we did. This is the series of steps. That's our Bridge of Lions, which is also manages to get water going right over the top of it, and seagrass wraps around those railings every time we have some good weather. Hmm. Okay. So we wanted to find out who our audience was. We had about 130 people that participated in parts of our workshop. Physically, they showed up. We had about twice that many that responded to the survey. We have seasonal residents too, ours are the opposite of yours, as they are there generally from Thanksgiving through Easter. In case you did not know, if you live six months and one day, you can qualify to be a resident of Florida where we have no income tax, which makes us really popular. And nobody really pays attention to count your six months and one day. So anyway, I thought we'd look at this, see what kind of people we had. In addition to our downtown, which is the National Historic Landmark District, we have about eight other neighborhoods, so essentially everything that surrounds St. Augustine and obviously on the north, west, and south sides are, is land, the east side is the intercoastal waterway and the ocean. All of those neighborhoods are listed in the National Register of Historic Places, so we have thousands of properties that we are concerned about. 
Republicans. And I think our filmmaker mentioned our governor, new governor Ron DeSantis, who actually lives in Ponte Vedra Beach, which is in St. John's County, the same county that St. Augustine is in. It's on the ocean. It basically is southeast of Jacksonville. It's where lots of the golfers and the football players and CEOs and corporations live. That is where his home is. He has created an Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. And we don't have it staffed yet, but we're hoping to see what he decides to do with that. But as you can see, nuisance flooding, high tide, water comes up, and sea level rise, so you get both. Is this a concern that needs to be addressed? 83% said yes on the nuisance flooding, and 79% said yes on the sea level rise. So unquestionably an important issue for our community to deal with. We only have 15,000 residents. We get six and a half million tourists a year. I am going home next week, of course, or the end of this week, and next week is the 4th of July, and we will have 65,000 people come to watch our fireworks over the water. A lot of people to try to have to evacuate if we have storms. Okay. Hurricane Matthew. A little bit in late in October, hurricane season is six months long, first of June to the end of November. Most people think it's August and September, and as long as we stay away from Florida over Labor Day, we're probably going to be okay. And certainly most people think that by the time we get to October, we're pretty much in the clear. Well, that didn't really work out too well. It was also interesting because we had not had major storms since 2004 when we had that quartet of Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean that did their rock tour through our state there in over a six-week period. From that time in 2016, we had a whole lot of northerners who retired to Florida. And if you live in the East Coast, you pretty much came down I-95. If you lived in the Midwest, you came down I-75. And if you lived a little further west, you went down I-65. There really are more than three roads to get back out of Florida, but most people apparently do not know that. So that was a change to the composition of our population. The other part is that now that the recession is over and we are gaining population again, we are adding 1,000 people a day, every single day, as residents, not visitors. So, lots of new people. Did we have financial damage, property damage, business interruption? Yes. This is along the bayfront, so the Intracoastal Waterway is just across the street from these businesses. The fort is in the background, the fort. Castillo de San Marcos gets 850,000 visitors a year. Some more storm pictures. This is King Street downtown and a shot of the Bridge of Lions there. We are incredibly fortunate in that when the water comes in like this, six hours later it is gone. It drains really fast, which is terrific because if we were New Orleans with different flooding, different subsurface conditions, where it's gonna sit for three or more day, four more days, we'd have a lot more damage to property. But we had a lot of people who literally closed the doors, got in their cars and drove off, did not do anything to try to protect from the storm. So. In case you have not, been to St. Augustine, let me give you your first official invitation. That's where I work. It's kind of an expensive little thing to take care of. Henry Flagler wanted a little hotel for his friends from New York and the Northeast. It turned into a 270,000 square foot building of poured coquina concrete stone, the first project for architects Career in Hastings. They were 26 and 25 years old right out of college. They had no idea what they were doing and put an ad in the New York Times and asked if anybody knew how to design a hotel. This has the largest collection of Tiffany stained glass windows in the world. We have 79 of them. Thomas Edison designed the electricity. George Willoughby Maynard, who did the murals in the Library of Congress, 10 years earlier did them in the hotel here. 
We also own 60 of the 80 paintings that Flagler had exhibited in the hotel at the time. We have entertained about eight presidents, lots of other dignitaries. So we have uh, the college students put on tours every year. We have about 50,000 people that come and take the tours each year. And believe it or not, as soon as the hurricanes are over with and we're clear, they still come back. They want to see how we've recovered. So anyway, this is our priority list. We want the bridges to be back open because we have a whole lot of people that live. We only have three major bridges and that takes you out to Anastasia Island, which is nearly 30 mile long barrier island. Lots of people live at the beach. Our government offices, our schools and educational institutions and bars and restaurants. Lisa and I joke because she was doing Annapolis and she said bars and restaurants were first on their top five. And I said, well, we just drink at home. We don't have to go to the bars and restaurants. And you know, Alcohol works just fine warm as it does cold. I mean, it's a few compensations. But. Okay. Do you carry flood insurance? Wasn't this fascinating? We had people that, like, weren't even, some of them don't even know you're going to see that whether they're in a flood zone or not. So, interesting information. This is plain old nuisance flooding. This is what happens at high tide. I take walks and take these pictures and send them to the city to post all the time. The 50th anniversary of the National Flood Insurance Program. Okay. What kinds of act actions have people taken? Do they even know that they have flood insurance? The law has changed in the last two years. It takes effect July 1st that if you have flood insurance, your bank can require you to escrow that money even though you, didn't, you don't have an escrow account for any other part of your mortgage. So that part has changed, and it's mostly because of the recent hurricanes. Again, we had two in 10 months. What we do at Flagler College is we feel like part of our academic responsibility is to have the conversation, to stimulate the conversation. So we put together a couple of programs back to back First time we brought Lisa in was during the Heritage at Risk series where we brought a whole variety of people in to talk about flooding, sea level rise, storms. We had thousands of people that came to the program series. Our college auditorium holds 800 people and on several of those programs we filled the auditorium. So we had people coming over from Gainesville, coming up from Daytona, coming down from Jacksonville to hear these speakers. That is what then launched us into, all right, we looked sort of at the good, bad, and ugly, and let's look at the future. So we brought in again, people from other speakers. This, we have half a dozen corporations that help us to underwrite this speaker series for the public, so it's free. So that has been a great way to begin or continue a conversation about what is important in the community and how do we address it. Now, Build Back Better comes out of Annapolis too. When FEMA provides funding, it provides funding for properties to be built back the way they were. Uh, the speaker from Sea Grant from Puerto Rico yesterday was talking about that. If you have substandard systems already, you can't build back better than that through the FEMA process. So that's going to take more action from your communities to figure out at what level do you want to be? What's the conditions? Do you know what the conditions are of your infrastructure? I understand you guys had some raw sewage issues a few years ago. So, which we frequently have happen during those hurricanes. It breaks the systems down. So, yeah. Okay. We look at Integrating our historic properties and our cultural resources. We do a lot of archaeology. We have the first municipal archaeology ordinance in the United States. You cannot legally turn over a shovel full of dirt without talking to the city archaeologists because we have some of the oldest evidence of habitation. It goes back 14,000 years. So we find stuff all the time. And we've done it. Florida is a leader in a public archaeology program. So we have a lot of volunteers that have helped us 
to document that history. It doesn't mean you can't build, it just means that we mitigate those materials and we take them out, we use them in exhibits, much like you have in the Whaling Museum here, we have exhibits of all sorts of varieties. And we have a lot of cemeteries, as you do here. Unfortunately, ours sit nearly at sea level. So when we have storms, you might get to see those relatives again, which is not particularly a pleasant experience. Hurricane Irma took out massive oak trees out of our two downtown cemeteries, lifted the roots of 150-year-old live oak trees. And sometimes those roots were, say, hanging out with your dead relative. So we had graves that surfaced after those rains too. Okay. Lisa and I facilitated a workshop where we again, same kind of thing you guys are doing. We brought people together, put them, and this is what we're doing here tomorrow afternoon. So I have theoretically a list of all of you that registered. I'm doing all sorts of research to figure out who you are. And then we will break you up into groups and you all get to talk to each other. What is important? And that's what we did here. And we had a lot of people, we got some really interesting answers. We have to talk at some level about retreat from some places. And that's a very uncomfortable conversation to have. We can lift some buildings. We can't lift everything. The Castillo de San Marcos National Monument is not liftable. It's built of individual stones. Flagler College, we are not going to lift the former Hotel Ponce de Leon and all five sections of it. That's just not going to happen. So what are we going to do when we have storms? Okay. But part of the recommendation, as you can see on here, is looking at how to triage historic properties. What can we be doing ahead of time so that when we have that crisis, how fast we can move and put things back together again or deal with them makes a great deal of help. We talk about PTSD in a serious sense, but we also talk about it as post-traumatic storm disorder. And I don't mean that to be facetious, but it really, when you start seeing, here's another hurricane warning, it's pretty upsetting. So the more that we can protect people ahead of time, the more that we can help them recover. It's really important, okay? We're looking at natural barriers as well. As you can see at the bottom of this, America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 requires federal agencies to consider natural shorelines. So building retaining walls is not the only option out there, and they are Band-Aids. They clearly did not work in Miami, okay? A series of best practices. Laser scanning. Marty Hilton and the Penn students are gonna present their results of that. It's an amazing effective tool to understand what you have to look forward to in the future. Model adaptation projects. In your community, once you've prioritized, decided what are the most important resources you have those can become those first projects to become your model adaptation projects. This was our ranking. Again, this is what you all hopefully are doing. Even if you don't stay for the workshop piece tomorrow, you've got the paper survey to do, please respond. Lisa's been pulling up the responses on her phone regularly so we can see how many of you have answered these questions. This was our ranking. Now, was I surprised that the Castillo ranked first and Flagler College second? No, they're two of the most iconic buildings that we have. St. Augustine National Historic Landmark District. Again, it's that Spanish colonial. The Hotel Alcazar is another Henry Flagler Hotel. It's also the Leitner Museum. Our Lincolnville Historic District is our African-American Historic District that was essentially settled after the end of the Civil War and goes up to the Great Depression. Government House is built on top of the, the property at the Spanish Plaza. So again, it has great history with regard to the Spanish ownership of Florida. Our Bridge of Lions is our two-lane bridge that takes you from downtown across to the beach. 
very decorative, very photographed. The lighthouse is not in any danger. It sits at the highest ground, which is like 18 feet. I know that doesn't sound like you guys, but that, that, we're just fine on that, okay? The Cathedral Basilica got water in it from both hurricanes. So we're there getting water back out of church. Florida National Guard. We have the first muster site in the United States. We have a national cemetery. Both places, again, damaged the last hurricanes. And then the plaza, the old, old Gonzalez Alvarez house is our oldest house, as you can see. Fountain of Youth Archaeological Park. You probably just thought it was a tacky tourist attraction. It happens to be the Menendez landing site where in 1565 Pedro Menendez landed. So it's an archaeological site. It's just that it gets wet. And again, some of those things come up out of the ground all by themselves. And Fort Mose is the first free, free black settlement in the United States. It's about four miles north of downtown. So that came in as 14th. Um, but those are the National Register individually listed properties that we had people rank. That sets our priorities. Businesses. We have a little bourbon distillery there that went into the historic ice plant building. They had $30,000 worth of water damage and they have a concrete floor so it, they recovered a whole lot faster than other places did because they could just basically let the water go on through. But they got hit by Hurricane Irma, okay? Your priorities with regard to policies and regulations. Note, protect the downtown core. That's our economic li livelihood as it is here as well. What do we need to do? Who else do we need to bring into the room? Bankers, financial institutions. So we get everyone included in that. All right, and that's our downtown streetscape. This is our city hall. Adaptation strategies for building. We should know, you should know here, what you would want to do virtually immediately so that you're not trying to figure that out because you're under a time frame if you have a disaster. So know ahead of time and tell everyone ahead of time. Uh, another comment from the man from Puerto Rico yesterday and that was reflected again uh, by the filmmaker today was know your neighbors. I live in an old neighborhood. We have people who have been there their entire adult lives. They're now in their 80s. We make sure that their houses are okay. If we evacuate, we figure out who's gonna help evacuate who else. So we, we still do old fashioned neighborhood block parties. Ours is right before Halloween and the kids get to ride their bicycles in their Halloween costumes and they think it's very cool. They don't realize that that's also where us celebrating, we're almost at the end of hurricane season and everybody did okay. But that we make sure that everyone comes to that block party. We know who's healthy, who's not, who's in North Carolina for the summer and who's in Nantucket for the summer. So if you don't know your neighbors, I encourage you to do that part too because that will help on some of those immediate steps and who gets you band together and you do the old fashioned barn raising and put somebody's house back together too. Okay. Flood awareness and education campaign. It's a lot less frightening for your visitors if, if you all look like you know what you're doing too. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, we board up houses. This is my little tiny house. This is when I'm getting ready to evacuate. This is what my husband's doing, okay? He's a contractor. We board up the house. We have neighbors on two sides out of four that don't spend the summers in St. Augustine. They go north and they don't prepare for storms. So therefore, all that porch furniture they left out becomes projectiles and goes flying around during the storms. So we board up. You have fabulous natural areas here. Figure out what kinds of alterations, perhaps, 
that could be done in the hard surface areas, hard surface areas to work more with the natural areas as well. Okay. 2015 was the city's 450th anniversary. It was also the, the Union of Concerned Scientists put the Castillo on the cover of its national landmarks at risk. Sometimes you don't really want the recognition, but it did bring some awareness. Citizen science came up in some conversation yesterday. We have, a, again, a very active statewide, through the University of West Florida and Pensacola, public archaeology program. It's called FPAN, Florida Public Archaeology Network. Started 12 years ago. We have one of the charter centers hosted at Flagler College. We handle about 13 of the counties from east, the east, northeast and east central areas. We have a whole lot of retirees that spend the winter in Florida, so we have enlisted them to become citizen scientists. We now have volunteers in every single one of the 67 counties in Florida, and they go through a training, and they go out, and they look at the condition of archaeological sites. We are now going to have them monitor the condition of buildings. This means they just basically walk around, take pictures, they have inventory forms, or they have um, iPads, but the point is, so we know the condition, and this has been incredibly successful. As of two days ago, I got a message from Sarah Miller, special category grant, which is our state legislative funding. There's no dedicated funding source. It goes through review process, but this is legislatively appropriated money. They are getting $595,222 to expand the monitoring. They will do detailed monitoring of 40 buildings, federal, state, local, and private, and they will continue to do all the shoreline monitoring, and this is creeks, et cetera, okay? Uh, Lisa and I were <laughs> taking sort of modified Keeping History Above Water. We're going to the Sea Change Conference in Blackpool, England, the week after Labor Day, because England World Monuments Fund wants to know what we're doing here. And Sarah Miller with FPAN will be over there as well. So the positive side of Florida and storms is that we are going to get to have an international audience to talk to and learn from. And uh, again, Marty and I didn't have enough to keep busy, so we co-chaired the conference. Those were the themes that we used, and we had strong geographic representation, as you can see. We also had a whole lot of partners. Organization, and we ended up, actually, at the end, I was having to tell people we we're already too far along, you know. In other words, we had already gone to print with enough stuff that I couldn't add any more sponsors. But the great thing is now we have, for example, banks and lending institutions that want to work with us. So, and I think that is it. Thanks. You've heard of something about Annapolis today, but what I want to talk to you about is basically the model, uh, much of which you've done here already with updating your hazard mitigation plan. What we talked about five years ago in Newport uh, is exactly what I'm going to talk about today and why it's so important to use existing planning processes so it's things people are comfortable with. Um, we had partners too, and I'm very proud to say that most of the federal agencies were our partners. Uh, we started with a model process developed by FEMA, integrating cultural and historic places into hazard mitigation planning, and they were a funder, um, as was the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, the Urban Land Institute, real estate organizations are extremely important, and they'll be your partners uh, on these efforts. Uh, the National League of Cities, Public policy plays an important role. They want to get good models out there. Um, Nantucket is a great model, and we need to now do a job of promoting what you've been doing here because this is a great start, and I credit the town for uh, working so closely with uh, NPT and with uh, PIN to move things forward. 
But I'm going to talk a little bit about our flooding scenario. This was actually Isabel when the water was going down. This is pretty much what sea level rise will look like. This will be Annapolis 30 years from now, every single day. So let me kind of continue through this effort. We branded our initiative, Weather It Together, saving our historic seaport. A brand is an important thing to have. It connects the community together. Uh, we are in it all together. So that was our purpose. Uh, also, because of this effort, our planning effort, the National Trust for Historic Preservation designated Annapolis its first national treasure in the state of Maryland. So a threat will oftentimes bring recognition. In this instance, it was good recognition for us because of the need for us to gather funding. Okay, um, we experienced the greatest increase in nuisance flooding in the past 50 years, 925%. Union of Concerned Scientists, the report that Leslie was referencing, is the one that basically called out Annapolis and said this is a community that needs to address this issue, so we did. <clears throat> Tidal flooding was something that happened regularly, but tropical storms have also happened just as they have in um, uh, uh, Nantucket. Uh, we've traced those storms over the years, and that was part of our effort to understand what our risk was, where it came from, and even more importantly, what our future was. So the, FEMA, the modeling that FEMA does, working through NOAA data, is great modeling. It's up to date for our purposes in our community. We've accepted the most recent 2016 flood maps. But what it doesn't really account for is sea level rise. Um, as you heard earlier, there is no magic number in each community. There are a lot of variables. So instead, we plan in the city of Annapolis uh, for a range between about two feet and 10 feet. Okay, that's a big range. But the reason we picked a range is just in partnership with the US Naval Academy, which has great data, great science, um, and some of the experts, we came to an agreement that we share a jurisdictional line. We have to work together. Um, we can't work independently. So we've agreed on a range, and we are planning for a range. That said, the state of Maryland has actually picked a number in the midline of about 3.7 feet for sea level rise by 2100. Every agency is admitting that is way too low. But nonetheless, what does that look like if we take the NOAA maps and we add the 3.7 feet? This is the US Naval Academy. Two thirds of it is underwater. This is all fill. Um, this is our downtown. These are the marinas, and this is our Eastport community, our maritime community, and all the marinas and the commercial districts under town. This is all our commercial district. It's 143 individual properties that are affected by this projection, and 60% are commercial. So again, just as with Nantucket, our downtown lives and breathes on tourism. And if it's not open, then we're not open. So we took this tool that you also have just gone through the process of the Holly, Holly, Holly talked about, and we incorporated not only historic resources into the hazard mitigation plan, we created a separate document. It is a standalone document that specifically is an addendum. It's 200 pages long, um, but we don't really use the full 200 pages. We have put it in a story map format that I'll show you in just a second, uh, much like uh, those of us who were at yesterday's, uh, Wednesday's conference heard uh, about the trustees story map. Um, we basically mapped through GIS, all of the affected properties within the floodplain study area. Um, we looked at our past mitigation studies that had been completed, and we realized that, you know, again, our downtown was pulled out as being an important part of our community to map and to plan for adaptation. We put together a local planning team. They were all local. We had a local architect, myself as a city planner at that time. We had a local community engagement person. Uh, a local planner, put the team together, but more importantly, we had 32 partners, agency partners, uh, community organizations involved over a three-year process. We had the technology, GIS, and we put together, including the budget for keeping history above water, because that's how we culminated our event, was doing a full three-day conference, $485,000. 
uh, for a series of initiatives. And a nice chunk of that money came from FEMA. And we are very grateful for that. Um, we talked about vulnerability. We assessed the actual financial implications to a property if we had another Isabel type event. We put together a formula and we basically said loss to a structure, contents, function and use and displacement costs can be calculated. We used industry standards for those calculations um, and we had a lot of partners that helped us with that. The good news about all of this is last year, no, just four months ago actually, we received notification from FEMA with a nice letter that says your plan has been accepted. So we are the first plan, the first cultural resource hazard mitigation plan using the processes that we came up with in Annapolis to be accepted by FEMA uh, through their hazard mitigation planning process. So we've just now legitimized these calculation tools that we've used because we had to explain our methodology through the process. Glad to share this with everybody, but the cost last year when the plan was submitted, basically our projected loss for 147 properties is $288.5 million. That's just physical cost. That's not even counting the tourism issues because that isn't a calculation that was factored in. Determining community value, we're starting that process with you all today by asking you to complete that kind of visual preference survey and the uh, community value survey uh, we'd sent to you online. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that more tomorrow. I'm just gonna pass that by. And we also used existing initiatives, the What Place Matters initiative. How many of you uh, have heard of the National Trust, This Place Matters? It's a very important tool for us to use, and we just used existing tools like that. We didn't create anything new. Got a lot of feedback from the community on that. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers spent three summers in Annapolis as volunteers because we were doing something interesting, and let's face it, it's kind of nice to go to Annapolis, you know? It's not the worst community you spend some time in. Um, so at any rate, they did some prototypes of analyzing what could you do to some of these properties. Everything from a 1700s uh, wood frame house to a 1930s uh, commercial block building. And they completed a report for us. Uh, they did mitigation studies, uh, an assessment, lowest adjacent grade on every single building within the historic district, really very helpful for individual property owners to know where their baseline is for uh, flood elevation in particular. And then we did a lot of community engagement, planning charrette, but also moving into a design charrette. I hope that's something that we'll be seeing uh, through the uh, grant process for the design guidelines uh, here in Nantucket. Um, and we came up with a vision, goals, and objectives. So again, a planning process, something planners are comfortable working with. Nothing new, just an important uh, tool in moving forward in preparing for resilience. Five goals, and I think what's important about our planning effort is yes, we need to lead building resilience. And when we said lead building resilience, it was not just in the sense of in our community, it was nationwide. I think part of our understanding as a seafaring community was that we should share our information and experiences with other like coastal communities, historic communities. Hence why I'm here today and many of our other planners have gone out with the same message. Um, and developing a disaster response and recovery plan to build back better. That actually is an international Sendai framework objective. We don't have to look just locally or at the state level or at a national level. We should be looking internationally for models. And that's the thing that we were able to do through this planning process. Um, some of these others, aligning land use and funding public improvements and incentivizing private investment all important, part of this is gonna be started. It's a five-year program, it has to be updated. So that's the nice thing about this tool is that in order to qualify again through FEMA, you must complete your hazard mitigation plan update. That means this plan has to be updated too. And there has to be benchmarks that are measurable and achievable. So use these required planning documents because it won't sit on a shelf. Um, 
The public awareness program was really important to us. You don't just do it once, you continue it throughout the process. It's an on, you have new people that move into the community. You have new property owners. Are you giving them the information that they need in order to adapt their buildings? So we also did a story map, land market risk. Much easier to communicate with the public through a story map than a 208 page document. So this is how we continue to gauge with and how we uh, began the process of engaging with the community. Um, I mentioned the prototype buildings, developing adaptation projects and hazard mitigation standards. This is a sample of what you get with an Army Corps of Engineer um, product. It at least gave us information we could give to these property owners and say, here's what you need to have in order to better adapt your building and look at alternatives for that. So the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about different models of elevating buildings. This is a challenge for the preservation community because it's about context, it's about how the properties look on the entire block, it's about physically what you can do to a building that still protects its historic character and its aesthetic, but at the same time ensures that the building is safely elevated and that your flood insurance costs don't become astronomical. You're doing something to demonstrate that you are mitigating um, uh, and adapting your historic building. So I'm gonna talk about two examples out there, and they're not exactly like, but they both are dealing with issues, whether it's tidal flooding and frequent storm events in Charleston, or something like a um, uh, hurricane, uh, or um, in this particular instance in Schenectady, it was in 2011, Hurricane Irene and what it did in uh, Schenectady. Both different types of communities, different types of resources, and one of the things I'm gonna just, as an educational piece, talk about, because within our world of preservation and flood mitigation, we talk about things like BFE and DFE, and that means nothing to most people. But your base flood elevation is really that line at which we know we are going to be flooding, okay? A lot of communities then beyond that, within your floodplain ordinance or your building code, require that if you're doing new construction, and you're in the flood zone, the special flood hazard area, for example, you not only need to build to a base flood elevation, but have what we call a freeboard. That can be 18 inches, it can be three feet. Three feet tends to be the highest level. I'm certain Miami must be up at three feet at this point. Um, but you add that to your base flood. So in a place like Annapolis, right next to the water, that means your first floor elevation is gonna start at eight feet next to the water, new construction at the city dock. When you've got a height limit of only two and a half stories, you have pretty much created a situation where it's economically untenable to do new construction. So these are things you need to think about and you maybe start measuring your, um, uh, your building height from the base flood elevation or design flood elevation. So we have to accommodate and adapt to these changing conditions. But at any rate, you can see the typical examples in Louisiana where they have a single family home and it gets raised and they do some depth. That, that doesn't happen in a row house community in Annapolis, okay? Where we have building next to building next to building. So how do we deal with that? And that is what some of these other communities are, are trying to address. Schenectady, New York, um, after the flood, for example, these two buildings here were condemned if they weren't going to be elevated. So this community realized it needed to provide some kind of design assistance in the historic district, the stockades the historic district, so they did. And I love this quote, because in essence, the State Historic Preservation Officer got together with city, and they said that preserving the historic district fully intact is secondary to preserving the buildings and neighborhood, which opens the option for elevating, moving, and otherwise altering these buildings. If they are not flood mitigated, they will become unlivable. The goal is to preserve lives and social interactions, not just the historic condition of the building. Again, we need to demonstrate some flexibility uh, from in the preservation community as to how we look forward to adaptation. So they came up with some lovely illustrated design guidelines. It wasn't just about here's what you need to do. It was let's show you how you can do that and do it successfully with your particular building type. 
Um, and it had a series of approaches. If you have to do a direct run, if you have to do a run up from the side, if you have to move your building back, how you address that. So again, a good publication and a baseline for understanding how to do successful design while you're still working in uh, the protection of the character, proximity to the street, the orientation, what we call a Secretary of Interior Standards. So then we have Charleston. <clears throat> now, Charleston has been hit uh, with three hurricanes in the last four years. And they have incessant tidal flooding. So again, um, this is a big issue there. And I went to a community forum where they were helping to develop the design guidelines. And community members were there because they were starting to get information from their insurance providers saying, you need to elevate your building, um, otherwise you're gonna be paying $60,000 a year in flood insurance. And that was just not something that they could afford. So they pushed very strongly with the Historic Preservation Review Board there to get some type of guidance for elevating buildings, and that is what they came up with. So through a series of meetings, they first started looking at existing examples, historic examples of how buildings had already been elevated or were well above the floodplain area in, in um, Charleston. And they showed, okay, this works. We, we have, actually, this is an unoccupied space down here in its false windows. You, we all know the Charleston uh, single house. You enter, and as you can see, obviously, this is your actually your first level of occupiable space up. This isn't such a good idea. So one of the things that the HPRB and the community agreed on was we don't need to create an opportunity for garages to be incorporated into the design. So there are examples of good and bad already. There were four major types of neighborhoods and building types they were trying to address. Everything from the adjoined buildings in the downtown area to the more domestic sister houses. Again, how do you deal with a neighborhood where every single house looks the same and at some point somebody's going to be popping up? Um, to the Freedmen's Cottages, very small, intimate uh, buildings in the African-American uh, neighborhoods. Um, and then these, the very high end along the battery, what they call category one and two buildings. They looked at uh, a number of areas, and I'm not gonna go through and read all the text. This is available um, on a set of slides that I'll keep, but they looked at site considerations. There are a lot of things we need to look at in terms of context for historic buildings. The site being a key one. How's the landscaping appearing? What's the streetscape going to look like if we make these changes? Um, what's the relationship between the sidewalk and the entrance to the house? And so they had a series of considerations and recommendations relative to that. And these are just some of the examples that they showed. Um, let's make sure we understand the approach to the house. Is there room uh, to do the staircase? Um, again, let's be sensitive about how we, what we've got for existing situations. Let's do some landscaping in front. We know we're going to elevate it. How do we deal with that? Do we move the house back? Is there room to do it? to the actual preservation and architectural considerations. Understanding things like, where's the chimney going? If you elevate the house, do you elevate the chimney? It's an operational um, fireplace at that point. So those kind of details uh, were looked at next, including screening and the like. Um, again, stairs. Um, what do we need to do to incorporate stairs where Previously, we wouldn't have had stairs or we would have had a stoop only. So um, those significant elevation changes uh, to the building and the approaches to the building and the fenestration patterns and the relationship to the streetscape are critical. So this is an example of one property that's being elevated. And normally when you come, came into this house, you would have stepped up and straight onto the piazza, the, the side terrace. Well, obviously they've raised that. So what they've done here is you do still walk in, but then there's a landing, another landing. And so you'll go up that landing on the interior. And again, this will be your base instead of what was previously down here. And then the chimney's being moved up. 
and the foundations. Okay, people don't really want to talk about foundation materials, but the reality is the foundations become a very important aspect of the building. When you're walking along the streetscape in Charleston, you don't want to look at a blank wall that's in a residential neighborhood. So how do we deal with the foundation itself as we're dealing with elevation of the buildings? Um, and what are the materials that we are going to use? And if the building has to be elevated, you're going to say, basically, we're not going to let you elevate it so you can park a car underneath. You need to elevate it to the design flood elevation level and figure out how to landscape around it. Um, that was one of the concerns they had, was that a lot of people would over-elevate the buildings. So again, looking at existing precedent and, and encouraging property owners in certain neighborhoods to do the same thing, to really look at you know, how do we deal with this level. Let's make sure that there are openings, even if they're false or blind windows, let's make sure that, that there's some pattern of openings at the streetscape. So in closing, I, I kind of say we do have choices. Um, and Jeff talked a little bit about this yesterday. I mean, we you know, can, we can ignore the science if we want to and just keep letting uh, things flood as they will um, and live with that kind of nuisance, or we can, you know, all build arcs and prepare for the worst case scenario, uh, houseboats, you know. Um, or we can wait for technology. You know, Jeff talked a lot about we don't know where we're going to be 300 years from now with technological advances, but should we all instead be building a treehouse together? I think that's not a bad analogy for sea level rise, frankly. Uh, we may be living in the tree houses. But um, one of the things I really love about the intersect between preservation and public art is this type of approach. How do we tell the public about this issue in a way that is emotive, uh, engaging? Um, this Spanish artist has done a series of these installations, and they're miniatures, okay? These aren't full size, they're miniatures, and they're very temporal. So the fact of the matter is, if you go somewhere where there's constant flooding, and you've got this installation, which is a bunch of politicians standing around talking about how we're going to deal with this issue, the next thing you know is the water has risen above them. And I think that's what we're trying to do with this workshop and bringing in speakers such as James and, and Jeff to talk to you. How do we deal with this and how do we start engaging and keep engaged our general public? And in conclusion, what I'd say is we have to do all of these things. We have to accommodate. This is uh, my Starbucks person walking coffee from the Starbucks over to a bunch of us waiting for how are we going to get to the Starbucks when it's flooded. They, they were prepared. They're going to accommodate the water as it comes. Um, we can armor. We can put up seawalls. This is an example of uh, a, a seawall with a clear glass so that you can still have that transparency if that's the direction you're going to take. We can elevate buildings, but we certainly, certainly must continue to educate. And I appreciate your time today. We'll take some questions if you have them, a few, and then we'll let you take a break. So, um, yes, I'll work the, over here. I, I think one of the key words that I heard you say um, with regard to um, codes, you know, building codes, and look at your height. Uh, your uh, height restrictions and being flexible. And there's a flexi flexible, being flexible is what I want to focus on because what I'm not hearing anything about, and, I, I, and this is more of a comment than a question, is whether there's anybody here. I think preservationists in general need to be more flexible when it comes to um, uh, new technologies. I mean, I, the material technologies so, so that you talk about having the, the foundation facades looking a certain way. I mean, there's so much um, composite technology and, uh, and I just wonder if in the whole mitigation resiliency discussion, there, there are also discussions about um, introducing new materials that are more permeable, that are, you know, made to look like there's such resistance you know we want things frozen in amber and and that amber is impermeable and we need to you know the water will come are you know can we be more aggressive about accommodate about 
uh, being flexible and welcoming new technologies and m with materials. Um, two questions to answer on that. Kirk may be more aware of it and have more details on it. The one thing I will say is the National Park Service is going through a material testing phase right now on what we would call archaic materials. Are you know, it's 100, 150, 200 year old brick or wood and how does it hold up against water when it's come into a house and it's sitting and then it comes out and then it gets dried and all that. So in some instances there are, is the ability to save historic fabric if you treat it properly afterwards if you don't come in and just gut the whole house or you try and dry it too fast or anything else. So I think it's our job as preservationists first and foremost to let people know how they might be able to save something or prepare an existing material to be saved. But then if it is lost, yes, we have to have some flexibility. Now, it may be the flexibility isn't in the front steps and that you're coming in and putting in some type of synthetic staircase in because that's gonna be replaced anyway down the road but maybe it's with a treatment to the building or the existing material. And yes, I think we need more information about technologies. And frankly, we need more businesses to look at this as an opportunity to do some research and to make some investment in this field of uh, basically synthetic materials for existing properties. I think that's where technology comes in. And I think we need to do a little bit more research about what is available out there um, that can be sustainable, because we're back to the environmental issues, um, but at the same time meets some of our secretary's standards. Because the standards do allow for replacement materials. It's just we want to make sure that it's the kind of material that you know, isn't going to detract from the character of, of the historic resource. So yes, we need to be flexible. Yes, ma'am. When you elevate a, a historic house, what happens to the fact that the sidewalk and the street is underwater? How do you get to these houses now? You want you guys want tickets? I mean, it doesn't I, have to be just about sure. me answering this. So, I mean, I think that is a terrific question that we have yet to answer, which is why taking this on a property by property basis is not realistic. Um, what we learned very quickly when we began the Keeping History Above Water initiative is that um, talking to property owners is important, but you have systems, city systems to consider, you have transportation to consider, you have evacuation routes to think about, um, cars, what role do they play in our future? Not only for the carbon load, but where do they go and what roads are we driving on? Um, and nobody has answered that super effectively yet. I, right. And I think, true. And I think that's why having both the public and the private partners together within these hazard mitigation plans and recognizing that as you know, you have to work with your public agencies to be able to help them with these solutions. How do we, I mean, my commission, I'll tell you, after we did Keeping History Above Water and we did this planning effort and we brought in the experts, the first thing they said is we're willing to raise our city dock three feet. We're willing to raise Compromise Street three feet. I mean, their point was that that was the issue that needed to be addressed specifically, and they understood and supported replacement um, and, and adaptation of what had been always the same elevation of the streetscape for 150 years. So, yes. So for, for both Lisa and Leslie, if you can answer this. Um, in the St. Augustine presentation, I noticed that the uh, least important voted site was a free black settlement that would have national significance, not just local significance. In the Annapolis presentation, I noticed that it was wealthy areas that were threatened by the sea level rise. How do you make sure that um, communities that are not wealthy are included in the discussion and are respected as we try and you know, relocate or save uh, these other areas? I think, I think that's a great question, and I'll, I'll start first and turn it to Leslie. Frankly, in our floodplain area, our 100-year, let's say, or even 500-year floodplain area, the vulnerable communities are not the residents. They're 
as you mentioned, fairly wealthy parts of the city. But the people who work downtown that are the service workers, the retail workers, um, the hospitality industry, come from all parts of the city. So in that instance, it's about jobs. And it's really about making sure that those properties are adapted because it protects a significant part of the local jobs economy, the jobs base. So with us, our next step as part of our plan was to really focus on the economics of downtown and how important it was to ensure that we um, adapted buildings because what we had at stake to lose was our employment base. And that had value across all the wards of the city. So that's one way in which we address the vulnerable populations. Does this work? Uh, two pieces. I will echo everything that Lisa said as far as our employees and downtown. We have the same situation there. Um, on the Fort Mose site, it's an archaeological site because uh, sea level rise had already taken it. And so what we have done is document as much of it literally with underwater archaeologists and terrestrial archaeologists and interpreted the, that information. And it's also part of the new UNESCO Civil Rights Trail so that we will preserve it in that sense from the descendants and memory, all that, even though the site has been gone for about 20 years. So as 1992, that Hurricane Andrew, when nobody was really paying attention to sea level rise, we've had five inches of sea level rise, and so it has taken it already. So we are, that's where we're sort of to part of what Kelsey was talking about is how do you deal with these when the physical resource is not there? So we're using every other sort of interpretive recognition that we can on that. And then again, the downtown pieces, we are very much changing as a community but our employees come from all over the county. We have a lot of college students that are employed there. And those are the ones that we are trying to make sure still have access to get back into the downtown as quickly as we can. And I would just tack on that your point is well taken. Preservation has a huge equity issue that we're grappling with as a, as a field. Um, but by contrast, um, look into resilient Bridgeport. So this is a city that's very unlike Annapolis, Newport, and St. Augustine um, that has its own heritage that it is um, looking at protecting from, from the very same issue. Um, and they've done some excellent work around community engagement and buy-in and investment to protect those resources. So it sort of serves as a compare and contrast moment um, to these other coastal communities that we're talking about. Um, I think we're kind of at a max of time. So if you have any more questions for us, please feel free to come forward and we'll give you about a 15 minute break here to replenish and then we'll be set with our last panel. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.